Amen. All right. John chapter 1. This morning. And we're going to read the Word of God uh, together. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 14. And uh, let's do this. Uh, this this is just an, an old church tradition. Uh, we just haven't done it in a long time, but let's do it this morning. Let's read this together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from John, or sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Last verse here. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Our Father in heaven, we come before you today. Father, I could stop right now. And the power of what we've just read this morning could be in our lives and shine forth and, and bring forth glory into our lives. People would say, man, what is going, what is, what is the matter with you? You're shining. You've got light about you. We could say to them, it's because we know who the Word is. We know who Jesus is. We know who our Creator is. We know who the Maker of all mankind is. We know who came into this world, but the world doesn't believe in Him. We know who came to the Jews to be a Jew, live as a Jew, but His own believed Him not. They didn't understand Him. But Father, we thank you that that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And Father, even though we have never seen Jesus face to face, we know that one of these days we will. We'll behold his glory. Lord, I believe we'll shout so that the whole world hears our shout. And Father, I know that Jesus came was made flesh. And if I was the only person in the world that sinned, Christ would have came to this world, born of a virgin. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, so that He could die just for my sins. Jesus, I thank You for being my God, my Savior. The one who is there with me when I'm not doing so well. The one who goes before me. The one who goes behind me. The one who promised to never leave me nor forsake me. Jesus, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And we pray this in your blessed holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Now over to Luke chapter 2. What we call the nativity story. Luke chapter 2 verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. That all the world should be taxed. 
Uh, this taxing probably had a lot to do with, number one, how many subjects are in the Roman Empire. They wanted, they wanted a number. And number two, they wanted that number to pay up. For every citizen, there was going to be a payment just for being under the protection of Rome. Verse 2, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. So if, if, uh, if this taxing were to happen now, then my mother would have to go to Levy, Arkansas. And when you see the sign, it says Levy. And if you ask somebody, where's Levy at? They'll laugh at you. And you say, it's Levy. Levy, Arkansas. And if they were to call me to my birthplace, I'd have to go to Jefferson Memorial Hospital in Jefferson County, Arkansas. There was a Jefferson County, Arkansas, a Jefferson Memorial Hospital in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Can you believe that? I'd have to go back to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. You would have to go back to the place of your nativity. But anyway, all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Isn't that something? House and lineage of David. Just like the prophets foretold. He was going to be the son of David. The son of Abraham, the son of Isaac, the son of Jacob, the son of David, the son of man, and the son of God. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they, the ladies, those of you who have carried a child up until the ninth month, how would you like to be riding side saddle with an old donkey? Not something you'd look forward to. Verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all white people. Is that what that says? To all Jews. No, all people, every race, every color. Every ethnicity. He, was, he came to be the Savior of everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Shall be to all people. By the way, I bring you good tidings. That's what the word gospel means. Good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill, toward men, to uh, our Catholic friends. You might want to show them in the Bible and compare our Bible with theirs and ask them, do you think God's glory and God's peace and goodwill should be only to those who are good people? Or do you think it should be to everybody? And if they say to everybody, then ask them, then how come your Bible's wrong? Because the Catholic Bible 
This is one of the first things that I ever looked at as a teenager to see just how wrong some Bibles were. And this verse in the Catholic Bible says something like, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men of good will. That means only if you're a good guy and you want good things for everybody, then you'll get peace. But that is not what it says. Christ came so that everybody could have peace and good will. Aren't you glad that he meant everybody? Because everybody would have meant you. Amen. And people of goodwill, I know you people, it would not have been you, I guarantee you that. Peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go now, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when that, those are the first evangelists, the first soul winners, the first people to go out with the message that Christ the King has been born. Uh, verse, um, let's see here. Mary kept all these things, pondered them in her heart, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And let me hear everybody say amen to that. You believe that. Amen. And listen, that, that passage of Scripture said absolutely nothing about Frosty the Snowman. Or here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus. Or right or Rudolph the the nosy red. Oh, red nose. Nosy I thought it was nosy red reindeer. No, it didn't say anything about that at all. That's not that is not what this is about. But as the world goes, that's, that's what everybody's turned it into. They've turned it into a marketing thing. They've turned it into a money thing. You'll hear on the news every year. Every year you'll hear a financial report of all the stores across America. And they're always saying, well, you know, this Christmas season wasn't a good season for all the store outlets. That be and I'll tell you this, most stores base a certain percentage of their income on what they think they're going to get during the Christmas season. To them, it is... That's why they started putting Christmas stuff out at 4th of July. Hurry up now, get it out there so we can start selling stuff already. To me, thats it's almost laughable, but it's not funny, but... Here they've made it into a merchandising thing. And what did Jesus say? My house shall be a house of prayer to all people, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. In Isaiah chapter 55, he said, Why in the world would you buy something that doesn't cost anything? I'm paraphrasing that, but why would you do that? Why, why would you... And I'm going to say this to you. Why would you willingly receive a gift from a family member or a friend or a boss but not receive the greatest gift of all from God why is it because you don't know what it is oh you know what it is it's everlasting life it's a life where you don't have to worry now about guilt anymore. You don't have to worry about being found out anymore. You don't have to worry about uh, the consequences of your actions and whether or not you're going to go to jail or whatever it is. It, that's the life that God is promising you. And it's an absolute free gift. You'll accept um, 
Yes, I'm trying to think of some of the stupid things I bought Lisa for Christmas. The the Ronco fingernail dryer thing. Yeah, I found out she didn't like that one. Why would you accept something like that and turn down God's free gift? That takes us to Exodus 16. Now, this is kind of following in the footsteps of the journey that we're taking from Egypt to the promised land. And after um, Exodus 14, when God wiped out all of the Egyptians, that was the point of, of last week's message was, in case you didn't catch that, is that the reason why God had you at the Red Sea, showing you the way to eternal life and Pharaoh chasing you, God knew, but he knew he couldn't tell you because then you wouldn't have done it. But God knew that in Pharaoh chasing you into the Red Sea, that was going to be the last time you were ever, ever going to see Pharaoh again. And again, I'm going to say this, if, if I could promise you, if I could absolutely promise you that the sins that you commit, that there's coming a day when you will never, ever, ever see those sins come up on you ever again if I could promise you that would you take that would you accept that the truth of it is some people would yes most people will not most people offered the plan of salvation most people offered the gift of God which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, most people who hear that message will reject it and not accept it. So Exodus 16, I'm going to read uh, verse 1, 2, and then you'll see verse 3 on the screen. In verse 1, they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin. That, that means Sinai. Okay, it is Sinai, Shin, Sinai. And it's where Mount Sinai is, okay? Uh, which is between Elam and Sinai. See, there it is. And on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation, look at verse 2, the whole congregation. Now, imagine this. You have been made free now from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. You're not making bricks anymore for them. You're not at, you're not, you don't have the lash applied to your back anymore. You don't have your children in slavery. You're, you don't have your family in slavery. You are free. But look at what they did. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They complained. Verse 3, and the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in, in, in the land of Egypt when we sat by flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You know, there's some people who refuse to accept God's call and His offer of free salvation simply because they've heard the wrong thing about it, someone's told them some lie about it, or they don't know anything about it, and they don't know anything about God, and they're afraid, and so they just simply won't do it. But then you have others. And I've seen these people throughout the course of my life Come into this church. Maybe bow at the altar there for a while. Preacher, talk to them for a while. Stand up and say, hey, so-and-so just gave their life to the Lord. Everybody comes, hugs them, gives them a right hand of fellowship. They get baptized. Remember what going through the Red Sea is. It's Israel being baptized. They get baptized. And then lo and behold, some bad thing happens. 
And I promise you, the devil will throw at you after you get saved. He'll throw at you everything he's got to get you to turn your back again against God and turn back to the devil. How many of you say amen to that? He'll turn, he'll turn, he'll try to turn you. He'll use your family against you. He'll use your friends against you. He'll, you listen, if, if it's drugs you're on, I, I guarantee you the devil will throw more drugs at you than you've ever had in your life. And he'll get you to try to turn you back. And so you're out there. You've already been washed. Now you're on the journey of life that God wants you to go. And some bad thing happens and you get mad and you get full of the flesh and you think, you know what? When we was in Egypt, we sat by big pots full of meat. Just cooking, roasting lamb, roasting fowl, flesh pots. Man, we'd throw in onions and leeks and garlic in there, and maybe a little cabbage in there, and boy, we'd have us a feast while we were in Egypt. And then we had bread. Oh, we had that hot buttered bread. You know how that was. See, I've heard people talk about the old days. About how when, after they supposedly got saved, they started yearning again for the flesh pots and the bread of the old life. And I can tell you that more than likely, those people are probably not going to make it very long. They're probably not going to make it very long. I know of a, a preacher, and I, I, listen, I looked up to this man. Preach, boy, he could preach. Pastor, boy, he could pastor. Evangelize, boy, he was an evangelist. He was pastoring a church down in Arkansas. The men of his church went to the hotel room that he was in with his mistress. And when he answered the door, those men of his church, tears in their eyes, said, There'd be no need for you to come by the church and get all your stuff. We boxed everything up for you. We're going to set it out in the parking lot. You just come by and get it. You're not our pastor anymore. And that woman that he was with moved up north. And there he had the opportunity to try to make things right again with his wife try to make things right again with his adult children try to make things right again with fellow pastors and so on but he got to longing for the flesh pot and instead of yielding his life back over to the Lord and trying to make amends for what he did he decided that he would rather spend the rest of his life with his mistress. So he left his wife, left his sons, left the dairy farm that he helped them farm, left his reputation, and just disappeared into the sunset with this woman. He got to longing for the flesh pots again. He's got them. He's got them. And you know what? They might make, as far as his flesh body, they might make that part of him happy. But his soul will always be warring against the Spirit of God. If God hasn't already turned him over to a reprobate mind. They said, when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. 
So now look in verse 4. I like this. I like this. I want everybody to do something. I want you to take your Bible. And I want you to turn to Genesis 50. Genesis chapter 50. John, are you turning? All right. We lead by example. So Genesis 50, and I want you to look over now at the next page, I guess. Does Genesis have any more than 50 chapters? No, it's just got 50, doesn't it? So everybody say 50. Now, what chapter are we in in Exodus? Add 16 to 50. What do you get? 66. You are in the 66th chapter of the Bible. Your Bible has how many books? 66. Do you think that this chapter has anything to do with the Bible? Oh, yes, it does. In fact, look at this. Look at this. Exodus 16. Verse 4, then said, now remember, watch this now. God's people are, are murmuring. Oh, we had it good by the flesh pots. Oh, we had plenty of bread. Oh, we miss all that. Now he brought us out here to starve to death. What kind of God are we serving? I'm here to tell you, you're serving the best God there is. Amen. There is nobody as good or better than our God. No one. So look at here. Then said the Lord unto Moses. Behold, I will rain bread. For, I won't do all that. But behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in. And it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And then God stops talking. I have those words underlined. Because there's exactly 66 words there that God just spoke to you. Woo! What do you think the message is going to be about today? The word of God is your bread. Amen. Amen. Sit now, here we are, 66 chapter. And God speaks 66 words to Israel to tell them, I've got bread that is it's not going to come up from the ground. You're not going to find it on trees. It's not under rocks. It's not down at the bottom of the lake. It is going to come down from... My goodness, the whole Bible came down from heaven, didn't it? In fact, the very Word of God itself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The whole Word of God came down from heaven down here to us so that we could read it every day. The reason, listen, you want to, you want to help get rid of those... Uh, that liquor bottle, you want to help get rid of that, uh... oh boy, should I say this? You don't even know what I'm going to say. You can get rid of them vapes. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'd much rather walk into a room where someone's vaping than a room where about 15 people are smoking, sucking cigarettes. Me and a guy one time visited a family, and it was a, a man and his wife, and they had adult children. And all three of the adult children were visiting that same night, and all five of them sucked cigarettes. All five of them smoked, and there wasn't a minute where one of them didn't have one lit going... And as we walked out of that house, smoke followed with us all the way out to the car. But I want to tell you something. God can help you get rid of that junk too. Amen. Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day 
that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. You see, the proving ground of are you a Christian, the proving ground that you have been truly baptized by God and that truly you are a different person is, will you go out and gather the manna? Will you go out and gather the manna? So now in verse 7. Oh no, verse 6. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, Then shall then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. You see, they're still questioning. They're still doubting. God says, now when I do this, when you wake up tomorrow morning, and there's bread laying all over the ground, You'll know that I brought you out of the land of Egypt. You'll know that it was me that's delivering you from alcohol, from drugs, from pornography, from fornication, adultery, uncleanness. It's me that's delivering you from all of these wicked things. When you, when you open up your Bible and you see in just about every page you read that there's bread for you in this book waiting for you. Amen. And in the morning then you shall see the glory of the Lord for, he, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. You know, I'd be careful. I'd be careful about who you complain about your church too or about things that you're not quite sure about the Bible I'd be real careful about that those things are better off if you want somebody to complain to go complain to the Lord God is a merciful God God is a good God and God can handle you murmuring. God can handle you complaining. God can handle you saying, God, I just don't understand this. God, God, help my unbelief. God, please help me. God, God will deal with that a whole lot better than for you to go around and trying to destroy Christianity, trying to destroy the faith of others, trying to tear down the church that you go to, trying to tear down brothers and sisters that love you, that are praying for you. I recommend going to God. Now, verse 27. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. <gasps> now, did you know that this was before God gave them the Ten Commandments? God didn't give them the Ten Commandments verbally until uh, Exodus chapter 20 where he says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor and seven days uh, rest unto the Lord God was already establishing a day of rest to the Israelites before the law and God said on the sixth day you better go out and collect double because if you don't, you'll be sorry. There'll be no presents for you under the tree. Amen. And lo and behold, there went people out on the seventh day and they're looking. Where's the manna? Where is it? Didn't God say, hey, God's a liar? And they go in and they go to complaining and, they, and, and somebody says, God's not a liar, you idiot. He told you, on the sixth day you gather twice as much because on the seventh day there's not going to be any. And right there you've got further proof 
of whether or not somebody is going to follow the Lord or not. Now people, like I said, I've been in church all my life. I've seen all kinds of people come in. I've seen all kinds of people go out. I've seen people come in, get happy for a while, do the church thing for a while. And then lo and behold, the old sins come back and start tugging and pulling at them. And then after a while, you don't see them anymore. And I want to say this. I want us adults to listen to this. To a child in this church, I was one of them. And I learned to just love and, and enjoy the men and the women that I went to church with. I thought the world of these people. One of them decided that he didn't want his wife anymore, so he left her, left the church. Another one decided that he wanted to believe in some false doctrines. And I'm talking about when I was a kid. And the pastor had to have a meeting with him. He left. And all of a sudden now, these people that I thought were great, awesome, wonderful people, found out that, that they weren't. And, it, and I just, I would, I would question that. I'm going, but why? Why? Why leave? It bothered me to see the adults that I loved and cared about as a boy in this church. It bothered me. It bothered me to see in, uh, I think it was 1979, these people that I loved equally hate one another so bad that half of them wanted the preacher out, the other half didn't. And so they just decided to part ways and never see each other again. I lost adults that I thought the world of. And in fact, I had to switch schools. Because one of those adults that brought up false charges against the pastor was my school teacher. And I'm, that affected me as a young man, as a kid. That affected me. And I just don't like to see people that I love getting at each other, fussing with one another, mad at one another, jealous at one another. I don't think we ought to do that. Because we're going to ruin some kids if we're not careful. So again, amen. These kids, they're watching us. Man, they're watching us. And if all, the, and if all we do is fuss and fight, and, and listen, I, I, I think I can say right now, we ain't got none of that going on that I know of. I think we're I think God's blessed us here. Amen. And I want to I want to hang on to that. So be careful. The devil he'll know who to get and he'll know how to get them. Amen. Now, uh, look at verse um, 28. And the Lord said unto Moses, "How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, Therefore, he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. In other words, there's twice as much out there. Abide ye every man in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. 
So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with what? I bet that was sweet and good. Amen. Honey buttered biscuits. Waiting out there in the yard for you. No, what it was is, I don't know, some kind of little deal out there that they could take and put it in a, in, a, in a mortar and take a mortar and a pestle and beat it into flour and they made cakes out of it or pies or cookies or birthday cakes or upside down cakes or whatever kind of cakes that they wanted. Amen. Biscuits and gravy if they wanted to. They could have it. They had bread. Amen. They, re they rejected against that too. Then back in John chapter 6. Mm -mm -mm. Turn there very quickly. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. In other words, the bread that Moses gave you sustained your flesh physical life. The bread that my Father gives you will sustain your soul for eternity. For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. He's talking about Himself, isn't He? Then said they unto Him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Let's, let's read that again and everybody read that. Say that out loud with me. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now I'd like for you to bow your heads. And this morning, I'm going to ask you this morning, tomorrow's the day we celebrate the, the birth of Jesus Christ, His coming to this world. And it's just like God giving us bread from heaven every day. By the way, the bread is the Bible. He's given you his bread of life which is the word of life and the word of God and he's given it to you absolutely free and I'm going to ask you this morning would you like to receive this bread so that you never hunger again. If you would, just slip your hand up, slip it back down, and there you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And in that, you're saying, Pastor, we, we, believe, we believe the Bible, we believe the things you've been preaching, but we've never come to a place where we just settled it in our hearts right now. That from here to this, this day forward, we're going to yield ourselves over to you. We're asking you to be our Savior. And we want to live for you. We want to live from you every single day. In other words... You're asking God for salvation today. If that's the case, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you come now and meet me at one of these benches?